people use their words to speak about who they want to be in the world and they're telling you the truth, but their actions are what show what they're actually capable of being in the world today. Life is all about relationships, lovers, family, body, or money. How satisfied you are can be completely explained by how you relate to things around you. This is Sophie Jaffe, and together with my husband, Dr. D. Jaffe, we are here to explore and teach you how to maximize your relationships and achieve a happier life. Let's get ignited. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this episode of the Ignited Relationships Podcast. I'm Adi Jaffe. And I'm Sophie Jaffe. And we're coming to you today. You guys have asked us to talk about dating. Here we so are. So we're talking about dating. Yep. And this today's Instead of like our chat part, it's going to be a panel that we did at Flora Vare, which um, they sell um, bridal wear. Yep. You got some really amazing, that can't be for a bride. I got, it could be, it hundred really? percent could be. It's like a beautiful white jumper and yeah, they're kind of, they're trying to redefine the process of what a bride wears, what the process looks like, going to look for a dress, how it can be kind of meh. And sometimes it's lovely. I mean, there's, it's not all bad, but you know, it, it's more affordable. It's very affordable, Is first it? of all. Yeah. And it's beautiful cuts and they're going to start doing, um, the bridesmaids also, they had some kind of like beta testing, but so they have just really beautiful stuff and they're changing the way that the whole thing moves and grooves. So it was cool. It was really cool. And they had a great vibe. So we did this panel with some of our really great friends that are in the industry and in the space. And we're all at different levels of dating, partnership, you know, you name it from yeah, all it was different. Pretty cool. It was literally um, Letitia who was Single. literally going on a date after the panel. Yeah. There's Krista who's engaged. Yeah. There's Ryan who's got a life partner. Long, long-term partner, yeah. Uh, and there's us. And I think we're like officially seriously dating now. Right. So um, it was really cool to talk about dating and the reality of conscious coupling Is the was the title of the panel. But that means so many different things to so many different people. Yeah. So we touched on a lot of different points. Really, really great snippets in this like great conversations i'm so excited for you to hear this but first we got to we got to do our thing yeah. so um review of the week coming up drum roll please amanda marie you're our review of the week and the title is listening to you guys give and then it's uh ellipses dot 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 i don't know why i cuss these shorts it's kind of annoying but anyway um, every time I listen to your podcasts, I wish every day, it gives me motivation to be better in my personal life. I feel like all that you have talked about goes in many different directions from cheating, anxiety, independently working from home, mom life, travel, and being your best self. Every time I listen, not going to lie, it's usually when I'm in a rough spot and I need some positive truth thrown at me. I appreciate you and all your guests that come on. I'm working through a cheating situation. The man cheated. And in the meantime, without actually knowing what he was doing, I felt neglected and started accepting attention from other men. Listening to your podcast really helps me realize that these things do happen and it is more common and there are ways to work through them. Again, I appreciate you. I love your podcast and listen to it as often as I can. A big red heart. Thank you so much, um, Amanda Marie, for that awesome review and the, and the honesty. Yeah. Thank you for that. That's exactly what we're doing here is just sharing our hearts and what inspires us and people in our lives and in our network that, you know, that we go to when we're in a rough spot. So thank you for that. And make sure you DM us or email us to get um, a D's book, The Abstinence Myth and your favorite philosophy superfood powder. Let us know which is your favorite or which one you would like to try and then we'll get it out to you. Yeah, totally. And you know, it's, um, Amanda Marie touches on on a topic that is important for people to realize, he, you know, she said it happens. We just got done with like a two and a half day fighting situation. It happened. Two and a half day. It was like two and a half days. It's like three weeks, but go on. Well, the, the, the fighting was two and a half days. It took, it built up to actual fighting. Right. The reason I'm saying it is as you go deeper, you find more things as you, Sophie and I talked about this on our recent vacation, like as you push the envelope and you try to, Grow. test new avenues in your relationship um and and yeah and grow and not stay stagnant things happen and it's um 
it's an important thing to recognize. And it's also really important to have expanders and have people that you can look to who show you the way. So we're so happy to be yours. It's also just important to know as we're going through this right now and forever we'll be going through this, that healing comes in waves and trauma comes in waves and sadness and grief comes in waves. And just to trust the process and understand that you are never fully healed. I will never be fully healed from what happened with the DNI at each level of the betrayal, the lying, the manipulation, the actual cheating. Like every step along the way, there will be levels inside my body that are continuously peeling away and healing. And then once that thing peels away, then the next layer is revealed and that maybe show up as anger or mistrust or or not, you know? And it's, But do you think that it's it'll never be healed or you'll never be the same? I'll never be the same. And I think that just, yeah, I'll never be the same and I'll never be fully healed. I think that, it, that, that it'll always be something that is there and present. It might not rule my life. It definitely doesn't rule my life anymore, but it's always going to be something that, you know, will be a part of our relationship sure, for better or worse. Yeah, I think that's true of everything, right? Leo has that cut on his forehead from splicing his head open. It's there. It's now part of his forehead. Like, it's never going away, right. but it's not a wound anymore. Right. It's, it's interesting. It's really interesting to kind of think of. It's now part of us. Yeah. Right? It's never going to leave. It's a part of us, and it's now a new part something of the structure to build of our on. relationship. Yeah, it's something to build on and be sensitive to. Yeah, definitely. And I think a lot of times, like this most recent argument that you and I were in, which lasted between two and two days and three weeks, it, you know, it's coming from a trigger that you had from me cheating on you three, four years ago. And that, and that trigger and that, you know, there's, there's work that you still need to do on that. There's work that you personally need to do on that and your whole something triggered something which made you feel like you couldn't trust me and it sucks and it's also part of the healing. It's, it, it's, it's a gift because then you get to say, oh, there's still some stuff here that I need to look at and that we need to look at as a couple and, you know, I need to be sensitive around certain things for you. And be aware that like, yeah, it was several years ago and there are great things that I did and showed up in it. And there's also ways that I could have been better and done better. And we're just continuously evolving. And that's. Yeah. And also proof to something that we tell you guys all the time. We share that our own couples therapist passed. Um, and we kind of sat because we're doing pretty well. We sat on the sidelines and said like, hey, we've got the tools. We'll do it all on our own. And, you know. That meant there was nobody else there holding our hand. And we, needed a account of, we needed accountability. Yeah. So it's, it's at least at that, it's an opportunity to dive in deeper. And look, for you guys, you get to benefit from everything else that we learn along the way. Absolutely. So it's really, really great. And we're seeing a new therapist next week. So we'll report back on how that goes. Absolutely. And you got a quote for us, right? Yes. Yeah, so my quote is from the book, Women Running Wild with the Wolves. And it states... Find someone you can be completely free with, sexually, spiritually, emotionally, physically, and cosmically, and go fucking wild. And I think that at every level of a relationship, you should think to yourself and check in, whether you're on this panel, dating, like, mm. like the pe people on this panel, dating, engaged in a long-term partnership or married yeah. any level along the way, ask yourself, is my partner and I completely free when it comes to sexuality, spirituality, emotional, you know, matters physically, cosmically, can we be wild together? Can we be free? And there are times when your answer is going to be no. And I mean, if your answer is yes to all those things all the time, please reach out to us info at ignited.com. We'd love to have you as guests. I think it's always an up or down. Right. I mean, I, I think that it's a constant striving for like, even in my friendships, you know, other than the sexual part, for the most part, um, my friendships should give me all of those things too. Like who can I, I want to feel fully expanded and fully wild and, and fully free 
in all the relationships in my life, but especially my life partner. And especially if I'm choosing them to go on this journey with and, and live life with. Yeah. I think it's good to keep in mind striving. You said perfectly, striving. Yeah. striving for those things, because that's when you go to your partner, you go, Hey, I think, I think we can do something around this yeah. area, right? Like in this area of our life, let's say let's the emotional challenge connection, ourselves. whatever it is, let's, yeah. let's push harder. We can do more. Yeah. And I can tell you, you know, and we've talked about this before in our relationship. So if you're definitely, I'm the person who's kind of just kind of okay with the way things are yeah. more, you definitely always want to expand and go farther. Um, there can be a challenge in there. I have to work really hard to not take it personally when somebody says that to me. Right. To not go, oh, then I'm not enough emotionally, but instead of go, oh, I can be more. We can just constantly be better. And I think that I think that there is a beauty in ex expansion and contraction. Like in the contraction is where you learn a lot about yourself. Just like in challenging times, for every ebb, there's a flow. For me, the hardest thing is being still. And not expanding or contracting. Yeah, that's what I mean, right? Like you always... I need to be experiencing. Yeah. I need to be experiencing to feel alive or I feel stagnant. And stagnancy makes me want, like, feel like I want to die. Like I don't really want to die. But sure. honestly, it really, when I feel stagnant, I feel stuck. When I feel stuck, I feel paused. And that is an, not a good look for me. Yeah. And look, you can't expand what you won't examine. So if there are areas of your life that you're not willing to look at, yeah. they are... Definitely not going to expand. They can stay the same if you're lucky or they're going to contract and become not just stagnant, but atrophied, like like a muscle that isn't used. Absolutely. So it's almost like our job in some way, if we want to at least stay as we are, if not grow beyond it, we have to always check in. Like I do, actually didn't do it this month because we've been all over the place and traveling, but I do the Ignited Hero assessments every month or every other month just to check in. How am I doing in these areas of my life? If I don't check in with them, I don't know. I'm not paying them attention. And then they're probably going to contract. Absolutely. And I think just constantly trying to be better and do better for yourself and the relationships in your life is the goal. Not, we're not saying you need to be perfect. Like by all means, just like happiness is a journey. Yeah. Just like balance is a journey. You will never hear us say like, oh, we stroke the, ba the balance. Like we've striked the balance. We'll never say, oh, we're, we're happy. We're, we're there. there. We've reached there. Like now I, you know, like your example that you give with working out, like, oh, I worked out like a lot for the last 10 months. So now I'm just going to take a break for the next couple of years because I've worked out. And I well, even imagine because you're uh, in fitness and nutrition. Imagine somebody saying, you know what? I did the nutrition right. I worked out for years. I got myself exactly where I want to be. Now I'm done. Yeah. And I think there is a beauty to taking a break. There is a beauty to not going hard all the time. I definitely encourage that if that feels right to your body. But quitting and being like, I'm done, you know, wiping your hands clean of any more work is just not true. And seeing with our relationship, that's what just our, as a, another example in our relationship, we've been helping lots of other couples. We've been, you know, doing workshops and retreats and we help people every single day. And we love that. But we stop when our therapist passed away, we stopped putting that love and attention into ourselves. Yep. And you can't, we can't, no one can, not no. us, not anyone. Like when I was a personal trainer, the best trainers in the club had their own personal trainers. Mm. They all had their own personal trainers so because it's accountability. It's just yeah. like, we need the best therapist. We need the best healers. We need to hold ourselves accountable to doing the work or, we're just going to stay stagnant. Absolutely. So coming up for you right now uh, is Sophie and I, Krista, Ryan, and Letitia talking about what it's like to date and be in a coupleship in this world. Enjoy. Make sure you leave a review. And if we read yours on air, we will give you a yummy prize. Love you all. Bye. See you on the other side. This episode of the Ignited Podcast is brought to you by Philosophy Superfoods. The Philosophy offers cleanses and other nutritional products that are unlike any of the other supplements and detoxification programs on the market. Why? Because they actually nourish the body with whole, live, nutrient-rich foods instead of depriving you and leaving you hungry. Have you ever tried a cleanse only to find out that you can't make it through a whole day because you're starving? Ever try a superfood shake that made you nauseous because it was so disgusting you'd rather not eat? 
The Philosophy Fix All That with a simple set of offerings that load up your body with nutrients while actually tasting good. Makes sense, right? Each of the Philosophy Superfood and Protein Blends is vegan, raw, gluten-free, and has absolutely no filler ingredients. With over 15,000 satisfied customers, including some of the world's biggest celebrities like George Clooney, Gerard Butler, Leah Michelle, and over 10 years of experience, this is the best stuff you can get. To buy some or find out more info, go to our website, thephilosophy.com. All right, so this is going to look really weird because we're all talking into microphones and there's absolutely no sound system up. So we're literally just going to be talking to ourselves into microphones as you guys are uh, watching. But um, this is the first time we're taking relationship talk into an actual bridal shop. <laughs> I think it's like the most high pressure situation of mm-hmm. relationship conversation you can have. There's really a lot at stake. Um, so happy to be here with our amazing friends um, talking about relationships about coupling about you know the the movement we have so many different representatives of uh, relationships and the relationship stages here right now which is really really beautiful and i love that um instead of me introducing because i know how nerve-wracking it is to have somebody else read your own bio (laughs) about yourself to yourself in front of other people i thought maybe it'd be really nice to just have everybody introduce themselves and for our listeners and for everybody here today, I think there's kind of there are two different aspects that I think would be important. The first is how do people in the world see you? What do, what do they know you for and what do you do? That's that's kind of the expected one. But the second one that I think would be important is kind of to set the baseline of your experience currently in this kind of continuum of relationships, right? So... Again, there's so many variables and so many ways that represent that. And I think just to start out to understand the amazing variability that exists here in this panel today, I think we can just start there. Um, I know your story, Soph. So <laughs> I, I want to go out with somebody. I want to go to somebody else first. Can I, can I do that? Pass the baton. Um, Krista, you want to get us started? Yeah. So I'm Krista Williams. I'm one half of the Almost 30 podcast. My best friend and co-host is here. <laughs> and we started the Almost 30 podcast when we were going from the transition from our 20s to our 30s. We felt like we should have more answers than we did. And we wanted to create a community and really get um, some expert insights and opinions on some of the things that we were dealing with, whether that was relationship issues or body issues or financial issues or spirituality coming into our spirituality. And now it's a community of amazing people all over the world. So that's what people know me as. And my experience with relationships Um, I'm engaged now, so I know all the answers to everything, pretty much. Um, No, I'm just kidding. I've been avoiding being engaged for a long time. But I've been in a relationship with a man for six and a half years now. And before that, I've been a serial relationship girl. Um, My relationships have provided me a space to which I've learned the most about myself. I had a great relationship with my father, so I didn't have a lot of shadow work as it related to men in my life. So I was really able to use them as a launch pad for growth. Um, although I have had some really challenging situations with men growing up. I think Ryan wants it next. And he's got his own mic. I would much prefer you introduce me, but I'll, I'll do it. I'll do it. I'll say. So I'm Ryan Weiss. Um, let's see. So I work as a life coach. Um, that's a term that I've been allergic to since I've been doing it for 10 years. <laughs> I think mostly because my goal with people is to help them realize that they are the best steward of their own ships. uh, And that has to do everything with how they are with themselves. So in terms of relationships, I know in my own life, um, the quality, the richness, the depths of my relationship, not only with people, but with money and food and sex and all the things we do is in direct correlation to how well I'm doing with myself. You know, am I waking up in the morning and feeling like shit about myself and feeling stuck and lost? Well, then I'm second guessing all my relationships. I'm feeling like, you know, the work I'm doing isn't meaningful. I'm feeling like I don't have enough. I am missing out on opportunity because I'm dragging myself. 
And uh, I think the reason that I love doing the work that I do is that when we're in that space, it's a real blind spot, right? We like, really can't see how we got here, how to get out of there. And I get the privilege of jumping into somebody's life for six months, twice a week, really in depth and like digging into s helping us together discover what those blind spots are. Um, relationship. I'm in a committed relationship for about three years now um, with a man who was also my best friend for 10 years, um, which is really amazing to jump into that kind of depth, the beginning of dating somebody, because you're not like, it's not like casual. <laughs> you know, It's like we've seen each other through multiple partnerships, through multiple lifetimes. Um, we have so much love and, and respect and dignity for each other. And I think there's a lot uh, we've, we're continuing to learn a lot about ourselves and about each other in this relationship dynamic. Awesome. Thank you, Ryan. And then Letitia, you want to introduce yourself? Yes. Hi guys. My name is Letitia Roll. I am the founder of Grow We Got This is a podcast. I started it because I broke up with my boyfriend of five years last year. And you know, like I was in like depressed mode and I had to tell myself every morning, I got this, like I got this. That's how I got through what I got through. So when I moved to LA, I packed up my stuff, got in my car, drove here. And I was like, I got to help women because I'm not the only one that feels like this after a breakup or after I get fired or after something like I got this, like we got this. So girl, we got this pretty much. It's just raw and real stories of women sharing their truths. And it's so crazy because every woman that literally... Every woman that I've met so far on the podcast, their breakthrough has come in their lowest points, literally a divorce or they get fired or they lose their mother or something really climatic really happens to them and they bloom. And it's the most beautiful thing. Breakthroughs and women, they're my jam. I love women. Girl, we got this. That's my podcast. And I also design baseball hats for women. I have all this big curly hair. And I could never wear a fitted baseball hat. So I made one. And then everybody else with curly hair needed one too. So that's what I do. Um, uh, my relationship, I'm the single one here. So I'm single and I'm mingling. I'm actu I actually have a date after this. Nice. So, so you guys know things. You got this. Um, but, you know, I, I never dated before. I never really got to know myself. i um, 31 years old. So I was in a relationship from the tw my, from my 20, I was 25 to 30. And it was great. It was crazy. It was wild. It was awesome. And it was highs and lows. But I never really got to know who I was. So the last year and a half, I chose to be single. Um, I chose to date just more recently. And I'm having the time of my life. So That's awesome. That's my story. So. <laughs> I mean, I'm not going to intro myself. Be, well, I guess, should I say I have to for all of you? Okay. I'm the other half to this one. Um, and... Ignited is a podcast we started, which we're recording right now, um, two years ago. And it was really because we were having the most amazing, magical conversations with people sitting around our dining room table on Shabbat on Friday nights or, um, you know, someone would spend the night and then we'd be up all morning, like for hours over coffee, just talking and talking and talking in the best conversation. So it was like, we would love for other people to be able to like sit on on this. And that's exactly what our podcast is like, is just like sitting in the room. We don't edit it. We don't take anything out. We don't read, do anything. It's just raw and real and vulnerable and um, really sharing our hearts and our vulnerability and our challenges. We've had a lot of challenges in our relationship uh, early on. And no, none. And we share all of that um, as a means to um, connecting to others and also allowing other people to know that we're all flawed, that that actually at our darkest moments is is when we can really find the light and rise and we are better for it. And um, whenever I talk about the cheating that we've been through on both sides, I always say I don't regret a second of it. I truly am so thankful for all of those experiences because it made us who we are now. And we showed up and we had to level up every single time something big happened. So that's really what our podcast is about is relationships to amazing humans and also to ourselves, most importantly. All right. Um, okay. So this is kind of the way I see the, the panel for us here today. First of all, I love doing live versions of these. So at any point in time, if anything we're talking about is something you want to hear more about, you want to connect on, we're actually all here right now. You guys listening at home, you can't see that. But uh, for you who are actually sitting with us here, if there's something you want to hear more about, I don't know, I think snapping your finger is a new thing, right? Raise your hand, do whatever it is that will let us know 
that that's a topic that you're really wanting wanting to dig on because we've talked. I mean, like Maddie's right here. Uh, she works with us mm-hmm. and on Ignited um, in our offices every day. The concept of relationships and coupling and how to consciously couple is definitely part of that. But you know, like anything else, the start of a relationship is unfortunately the easiest part of it. Like anything else you do in life, right? You get a great idea for a business. That's the most exciting, enjoyable part of that business you will have. Making it happen is the next step. And then making it last and continue, hopefully, forever is sometimes the most difficult part of the equation. And when I say difficult, I don't necessarily mean in that sort of grinding, uh, something that you have to detest or something you have to you know, um, not enjoy as you're going through it. But it's it's the ongoing process of relationships. And we literally just recently talked about the difficulty, the way we see it. Now it's funny, right? I'm, I haven't been single in really like 12 years since engagement, right? 12 years. So we were literally just talking about this this last week about dating or the world of the beginning of relationships as it exists right now in a time like no other, right? Um, in a time where choice, selection, the the knowledge that the options are almost limitless, maybe especially in a place like Los Angeles mm-hmm. in the world, right? Almost puts this, um, almost puts to the side the thing that has existed in relationships for so long. And that is when you find somebody special, when you find somebody that you can connect with, part of the reason you do all the work is what? Why do we do all the work in a relationship? Anyway, we got four of you. Because right we here. think we're, they're going to be the one? Yeah, because we don't want to lose them. I mean, isn't that part of the reason we do all the work in a relationship? Is you go, I found somebody special. Maybe I don't love how they like to go out on date night and the, you know, maybe I'm not a huge fan of the dinners they choose. But it's not that bad. It's much, much better than going back out there and, and being out in the date. Has anybody ever had that thought? Anybody in the room? Like your partner listened to a song that you would never listen to in your life and you go, I'll take that. That's fine. I'll, I'll deal with that one, right? Yeah. I feel like now the problem is you can always go, well, I don't, I've got like 400 right swipes. Let's just see what else is out there. And I wonder sometimes, because we, when we talk about the idea of conscious coupling, right? If the consciousness part of coupling has not disappeared, but has been made... Um, more challenging by the lack of consciousness and the the brevity that you can just have at, at meeting new people now compared to ever before. I don't know um, if that speaks to you guys. I'm on dating apps and it's wild. And I've never had to be on a dating app before. So coming into this dating world at 30 years old, I was like, what is this? People are on like all these apps. And I'm like, I had X in check. What? It was so weird for me. And then I'm like, all right, dude, maybe he knows how to like select the pictures. Maybe he has a girlfriend that could help him because some of these guys have no idea. So it's so weird because it's so like unauthentic to me. But also in my life, I'm an entrepreneur. I don't have time really Mm. to be out and about and hanging out and like meeting people. So literally the only way I've been meeting people is on dating apps. Um, But I, I changed my thinking. And in the beginning, I was like, what is this? This is weird. Technology is always evolving. It's always changing. Mm -hmm. It's just going to keep evolving. Who knows how we're going to be meeting people next. But at the end of the day, I stopped being so critical about it. If something caught me off guard, I'm going to hit hard. If something caught my attention, I'm going to heart it. You know what I mean? He has to say something first. So that's like my rule. (laughs) (laughs) Maybe I'm not saying anything first. He has to say something first. And then we'll see what happens, right? Because in the beginning, I was like, this is weird. Like, XXX checked. It it was just, it was really inauthentic. But now I see it as something fun. I'm going to meet another cool human. I like his music. You know what I mean? I like the way he looks. Then you go on the Instagram, you do like your whole, it's like a screening. We have like background checks now. (laughs) So I'm, I actually enjoy it now. It's fun. Um, it's, it's work though. I feel like it's work on top of my work. So it's some, I don't like that feeling. Mm. Um, and I, I find that to be a struggle dating here in LA. And I'm new to LA. I'm, I've been here for a year. So that's a whole other thing, dating in LA in general. But 
you have to make it fun. And I think that's what changed everything for me in my head because some of my girlfriends like literally are like, oh my God, dating sucks in LA. Yeah. I'm like, dude, I've had like great dates. What are you talking about? You know what I mean? So you can't allow other people's experiences to affect you because I feel like it was affecting me in the beginning. Um, but now I'm having the time of my life, honestly. I have, a, I have a question. Yeah. I have a lot of single friends for some reason mm-hmm. right now. They're all, I think, like, we're an expander yeah. for them. So, like, they come to us and then ask us. Totally. Like, we don't know. We're not dating. <laughs> but I have so many single people in my life right now, and it's really, like, abundant feeling. Yeah. But they're always like, we're looking to you to hook us up. I'm like, I don't have <laughs> anyone but you. You are my single people. Yeah. But they seem – a lot of my girlfriends right now get into a place – where I hear what you're saying about other people affecting your dating mm-hmm. experience. But what about when you have bad dating experiences? How how do you continue to throw yourself, like, specifically a friend who's in her mid-30s. She wants kids more than anything. She, like, knows what she wants. She's been through lots of monogamous relationships. It's hard. She doesn't want to go on apps. But it's really hard to meet people, like you said. Yeah. And then she throws herself back on there. She gets back on the apps and she like pulls her bootstraps, you know, like she does it and motivates and then has a bad date or a bad experience. She's like, this isn't for me. How do you keep motivated and how do you keep going back to something that feels, I mean, obviously the app isn't the problem, right? right? right. Like, <laughs> no, hundred percent. You can't have expectations in dating. Yeah. And I think that's one thing us women do. Mm-hmm. Uh, men do it too, I'm sure. Uh, if you have expectations, like that's like your first sign up to like, well, this isn't going to work. Like yeah. you're expecting way too much. You got to go in it light and open Fun. and you can't go with your list. You know, like we have our list, this checklist and all this stuff. We can't, you got to go on there open. And that's what I would say. You cannot have expectations in yeah. dating. You have to enjoy it. That's what can I've I, learned. Can I ask a question? Cause something that comes up for me is I know in a lot of com- dating conversations that we've had on the podcast before, there's all this like calling in the one work. Right, they're all there's all these worksheets. Ryan, you're in the coaching world like I am. Yeah. There are all these worksheets and, and workbooks and courses on calling in the one. And a lot of what that work is around is really getting very clear on what it is that you want. And I've always wondered about it. I have to be careful because my wife is like the the queen of manifestation. So I always I always wonder because then eventually she's gonna prove me wrong when I say the next thing I'm about to say by just proving she can just manifest the thing that she imagined without what I'm about to say right now. And that is when you try to create who this person is that you want, you're doing it from the perspective of everything you've experienced up until this point. Unless you can elevate beyond that. If you have some way of opening up your consciousness to what is feasible beyond what you've experienced, everything we imagine in our future is based on everything we've had up to now. Does that make sense? Yeah. Which means that the person I'm creating in my head who I want to date I'm basing on the experiences I've had up to now. Mm -hmm. Now, that might be great because all the experiences have been amazing and wonderful and all the people I've met and dated were amazing people. But also, they haven't worked out. That's why I'm having this manifestation issue in the moment. So, I always wonder how much more useful it could be to sort of put that away and instead tune into not who you want, but maybe what feeling you want to have when you date somebody. Right, how do I want to feel? How, how do I want the person that I'm with to make me feel? Um, what do I want that to be like yeah. versus what do I want them to be like? Because obviously I don't know what the person that I want if I've never found my one to be. I, and now I'm just making up some cartoon character in my head and I'm going around dating apps looking for that cartoon character and anybody that doesn't look like it, I push to the side. Yeah, I think, you know, that's a vibrational thing, like thinking vibrationally, what's the vibration that you want to feel, getting yourself on that vibrational level to be able to attract that. For me, I wrote down exactly what I was looking for and put out the intention and and did sort of the manifestation that I imagined at the time and called Justin in. And it's been, you know, the biggest learning lesson for me, I would have probably added some things, of course, (laughs) as it relates to communication and all of those things. But I think people can call in whatever 
it's like that works with any way in life. Like our limitations are going to stop us or put us in a place where we're going to get whatever we can manifest at the time. And then you either manifest beyond that or manifest something within that relationship, you know, from that vibrational level. But I think it's really getting on that, um, you know, Danielle Laporte does the work related to thinking with your feelings first. And then Abraham Hicks about being the vibration of what you want to attract is really the key. And I think with anything in relationships, I always just bring it back to myself. Every single thing is an emanation because of me within my relationship. How I'm feeling vibrationally will show up with him, will show up with us together. So me focusing on really what I can do, how I can be the clearest vessel, how I can be the most loving will show up in like droves of the love that we can create together. You said that perfectly. Um, The other piece that I would also add to kind of what you were just talking about in terms of, so you're doing this kind of quote manifestational work, calling in the one, and then you call in somebody and you go on a date and it's not the person, right? And we can tend to go into this whole story around, see, it's not working out for me and I'm trying and I'm like setting my goals and it's not working. And, you know, it's maybe because that man or that woman doesn't actually exist. And, and now we're spinning right in our head of our own destruction. Um, what I like to remind myself, myself in those moments and hopefully remind others in those moments is I, you know, this conversation on manifestation is really interesting. I think there's so much focus on what I want and like that higher rung of the ladder and like reaching and trying to pull myself up from it. But there's a lot of crap in that. There's a lot of resistance in that. There's a, and there's likely a lot of believing that you don't deserve whatever it is that you want, but trying to force yourself to believe that you deserve it. And so a big piece of that puzzle is actually Right. So like you were saying, it's like, instead of focusing on who I want, it's like, right, who am I? Who do I, who, who am I? Who I, who am I truly? Right. And I can go into a whole spiritual kind of whole thing on that of like, of course, of Mir- well, okay. So I'll go there for a second. I'm a student of A Course in Miracles. It's a metaphysical text. I'm going to run through this like really quick spirituality 101 on on this idea. Is like so A Course in Miracles defines enlightenment, which we're all apparently on this earth to become enlightened. It says enlightenment is the shift in our identification from I am my personality or my body to I am spirit. <clears throat> so that's a big thing to say, right? We're all ultimately on a journey to shift who we think we are. We learned who we are. It's not who we are. We're not our name. We're not our job. We're not our personality. We're not our money. We're not our bank account. That's all the things that the world defines us as, uh, which also means we're temporary. I only have a certain number of years to live my life, get it all in, get the guy, get the home, get the job, get the money, and then I'm going to die and it's all going to go away. And that's kind of the ego or the separate personalities version of self. And base, if I'm believing that that's who I am, which is what we're we all grow up believing it's like what we all grow up learning about ourselves then i will base as you were talking about i will base who i think i deserve based on who i think i am Mm -hmm. and so the spiritual true spiritual unfolding in all of us is about unlearning that that's who i am and starting to tap into i'm natural intelligence i'm spirit i'm energy i am that which was created by an ingenious unbelievably enlightened powerful creative force giving words to what doesn't actually have words right and that i start tapping into that that's who i am right through my meditation through whatever my healing journey is through whatever my mushroom journey is if i go on a trip like whatever it is these are all doorways to i love truffles truffles are great. <laughs> yeah yeah they're great um anyway so so point being is if i am walking around the world knowing wait i'm actually that which was created by genius i the the energy that is me is genius it doesn't make me special because everyone is that same thing then of course i deserve the guy the girl of course i deserve the joy the happiness of course i deserve the person that's successful and blah 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 and i go on dates differently right so so Instead of thinking, who do I want out there? It's how can I know myself to be myself as I truly am and be that self fully embodied walking on the earth. It's easier said than done, right? I'm not saying that any of this is simple. This is like, there's a reason we have a lifetime to do this stuff. So then while I'm doing that stuff, as as I'm upgrading, so I go on that date and I'm sitting across from the person that doesn't reflect what I was hoping that they were going to reflect or be right. Not at the level that I was hoping for that becomes an opportunity to say no. 
right? And I think that is a huge part of manifestation is looking at the rung where you're on right now, knowing you want to go to the higher rung, realizing I'm on this rung right now. So as I'm saying, I want to go there, stuff from this rung of the ladder is going to continue coming to me right. and getting to that next ladder isn't so much about pulling myself up there, but it's about learning to say no to the things that are coming to me where I'm at right now. Mm. I love that. I love that. Yeah. You know, the reason, the reason I think that's such a powerful thing is, you know, Sophie and I talk to a lot of couples who are struggling. They read our story, they hear about what we've been through or whatever, and either they've gone through something similar themselves or just at best they've hit a plateau in the relationship and it's sort of stagnant and at worst it's crumbling and they think that two months from now they might be done. And not always, but oftentimes there's a, especially at the beginning, there's the tendency, if the person that is coming to you is the one who screwed up, the one who did something wrong, there's a tendency to fully engulf oneself in shame and guilt about what he or she did. And if it's the other person, there's a tendency to just point the finger and, and fully deflect all responsibility to the other person. And I mean, Sophie and I have been through a lot and have come out of all of it on the other side stronger. So every time, it, it's a continuous journey. It's not like it really ends. Right? It just keeps happening because life happens. Like whether you have a job or you're in a relationship or you bought a house, things come up in life. They never stop. It's not like you ever reach a point where I, I say this always to my clients. Like you don't do this with working out. You don't say, you know what? I had a really amazing spin class yesterday. I'm good spinning. I'm not, I never have to do it again. I just hit my best. You don't do it with dieting. You don't say I've, I've eaten clean for a week. My body now knows what that feels like. I never need to eat clean again. Don't remind me of all these things. <laughs> <laughs> right? So we do it on a continuous basis. But somehow in relationships, we have this belief, almost like Ryan was just saying about that we will kind of find that person that will lift us up to the yeah. next rung. We have this belief that somebody is going to be able to give us what we're missing. And it's never true. Ever. Ever. It doesn't matter how amazing of a partner you find. Can I jump into that really Please. quickly? Because what you just said is so key. If I'm believing that I'm missing something, then I will always attract into my life um, evidence that I'm missing something. Yeah. Right? If my core belief is there's something wrong with me, hi, love. Um, if I believe that there's something wrong with me, there's something missing within me that I'm not a complete and whole human being on my own as I am blessed and abundant. And then I will attract the mirror that shows that to me. So when you said there's no human that's ever going to pull you up to believing in yourself, there's no thing that's ever going to come into our life. That's going to be the thing that finally go, Oh, I, it all has clicked. Now I finally feel good about myself. Mm. It's a chicken egg situation. It's I practice every day learning to feel better about myself by unlearning all the crap that I've learned along the way. And then I start seeing the evidence that reflects that yes. to me. Yeah. So here's, a caveat to that is because I, I think, again, I'm blessed that I found Sophie because I came from a place where I was all self-judgment. Like growing up, I talk about it sometimes in the podcast. I definitely have the history to prove that I didn't think I was worthy because you get what you think you are. Um, but one of my evidence for that is how many people know the band Nine Inch Nails? I, might, I know I'm old, but okay. Okay, perfect. Thank you for that. Thank you for the acknowledgement that band. other people. Um, <laughs> No. <laughs> <laughs> Ryan, oh, Ryan, like sends, Ryan sends a really to Krista. Um, this was my favorite band, like junior, sophomore year to like the middle of, end of college. That was my favorite band. If you don't know them, happy go lucky sort of really uplifting songs <laughs> is what Nine Inch Nails is known for. Uh, my son is here, so I can't repeat many of the lyrics, but they it's dark. Mm -hmm, yeah. I mean, every song is about the full perspective of everything that, that is wrong with the world. By the way, I believe that some of those things are true. Uh, it's not that, they're, that the evidence presented like by the band isn't true. It's just that I was surrounding myself with that thinking. And as I was surrounding myself with that thinking, I kept finding more and more evidence in my life of how terrible the world is because it was right there. The song would be there in the background. As I'm looking at the world, my brain would attune itself. You talked about vibrations before, literal vibrations, right? Music. Um, and it would attune itself to everything that is terrible in the world. And that was my, my mantra, the way I worked, the way I walked through the world. When I would journal, when I would write music myself, it was all about the darkness. 
Um, and it was so much so, and I don't know if this speaks to anybody either who's listening or who's here in the room right now. It was my full belief that that's what the world was. Mm-hmm. That the world was um, dark, depressing, that I was not worthy, but that nobody else was worthy either. And honestly, when I saw people who acted like they were happy, I thought they were lying all the time. That was my core belief was that people around me were lying. And the reason I'm saying I'm going through all that is I wasn't in a place where anybody who looked at the world as a happy place to live in would ever, ever imagine being with me. Because all I would do is I would be that anchor that would just bring them down. I would doubt every word that they would say. I would think that they were lying. I would kind of try to prove to them that um, that things are wrong. By the time I met Sophie, I wasn't in that place anymore. And you said, Ryan, that people can't bring us up. I think that's true. And yet, there's this, it's like this catch-22. People can't bring you up, but you have to have a network of people. You have to have some support. It's like a it's like a plant that has to grow in a medium of some sort in an earth. You have to have a surrounding earth and material that will support your growth. Because I think a lot of us surround ourselves with everything we don't want, everything on that rung, and we accept it all. We just take it. Where's Leo? Okay. People who talk shit about other people. People who constantly complain about everything that is going on in their life. They wake up in the morning and everything they talk about is what didn't work out, what isn't going to work out that day, how that person screwed them over and the other person screwed them over and how it's never going to work out. We sometimes surround ourselves with these people and then we wonder why we're stuck. And part of the reason we're stuck is, you know, Ryan mentioned all the things that will come at you from the wrong way that you're at. If you're trying to uplift, all these other things will weigh you down. And I know for a fact that when I was in that space and when I went through my kind of trials and tribulations, my bottom or whatever anybody wants to call it, it was my family and the handful of friends that stayed who saw more in me than I saw in myself and were able to provide that support. And so I would argue that for the people who are looking for a better partner and are still having a hard time finding what that is, sometimes being radically transparent and honest with the people around you and saying, I'm struggling right now, but I don't want to anymore. I want to level up. I need you to start showing me what else is possible because other people can reflect to you at least you what is possible for you. Yeah. I think just hold you accountable too. We just ended, um, my best friend Rochelle and I just ended a retreat in Sayulita and we were really, all of us, including Rochelle and I, like these are the things that we want to bring into our lives or these are the things that we want to change or these are the things we want to catch ourselves on and not do anymore hold me accountable. And we had everyone text their friend, their best friend, their sister, whoever it is that that's their person, hold me accountable on this. You know, Rochelle's dating and she doesn't want to be, um, what was her thing? She was just like, I don't want to complain about my ex lovers anymore. I don't want to, I don't want to let the, the story of what was weigh me down now. And I don't, it's like the drama of it. Why am I still repeating those stories? I'm not there anymore. It's it's keeping me there. Mm-hmm. And she knows that. So she told she texted a couple of friends. She said to me, please don't let me get in that story anymore. Don't let me talk. Thank you to them for the experiences and goodbye. Mm-hmm. It's that subconscious programming, you know, that you have. But what you're talking about was interesting as it relates to using your community and the people that are around you as mirrors for you. And within my life, my relationships with men have been such strong mirrors for me. And I've really, I've had much easier relationships with men than women. And it's really been beautiful for me to see what they see in me, like even the positive things, and really take those in as like something that I really cherish about myself. So learning the things that they love about me, seeing that in myself, and then really just using that as like a way that I shine in the world. You know, them seeing me as funny or something like that. I'm like, oh, you think I'm funny? I'm going to continue to nourish and flourish Mm -hmm. and like really hone in on that because someone recognized that in me. I love that you said even the things that they find that are positive in me. Mm -hmm. Again, right, it's this, there's this really nuanced place, I feel like, for us. I don't know if, I don't think it's LA specific, but I've been mm-hmm. here for 23 years, so it's hard to tell now at this point. Um, I feel like so often we try to hone in on this line in our communication that is not pejorative, that doesn't put us down, but also doesn't boast too much. And it's actually something that I'm trying to work on. Like, why can't, why can't we really celebrate all the amazing things that are good about us, right? Like, does anybody else feel like that ends up happening? Like, you can't really celebrate the 
great stuff because you feel like you're showing off or people will be jealous or whatever. I want to get to a place where you can share the bad stuff as it happens and not need to hide it, but also share the good stuff. I had an amazing time in this place. We had all these amazing experiences without really thinking to yourself, am I going to make somebody jealous or am I going to upset somebody? Like, If we can all just get back to sharing our reality in a really transparent way, I think it would also go a long way towards allowing us to connect truthfully. Mm -hmm. Every time we check out from somewhere, I, I always try and buy my friends a drink or whatever, or dinner. And I always like, when I pay, they're like, oh, let me pay. I'm like, no, I'm really rich. Mm-hmm. And I always laugh and everyone always laughs. And I'm kidding, but I'm not. Mm-hmm. And I'm always like, I can't wait till I'm like really rich and like I'm serious about it. Yeah. And no one will laugh. But I'm like, I'm kind of like towing the line. I'm like, I'm really rich. And everyone's like, ha ha. Like, I don't know if I am or not. Like, but it's one of those things where like, there was one girl that everyone was kind of uncomfortable. They're like, is she rich? I don't know what's going on. And I was like, damn, like, what if I was really rich? You know, like, I'm trying to like boast and be like standing in my truth of having money or abundance. And it is like people can't take it seriously. Like, I'm from Ohio, small town. So we kind of get off on self-deprecation and mm. like making others feel better in that way. So that's just in my blood to like to do that. No, everyone asks me that. I'm like, I don't know, man. <laughs> I don't know. Oh, wow. I Same. Didn't have to become that serious. <laughs> no, no, no. no. <laughs> I actually don't know what I am, but um, I'm just me. And um, yeah, but we also we talk about that a lot in the podcast is really standing in what you're really good at. And I think for women especially, I will I will make that statement that it is a little bit more challenging because we have been accustomed and like you know, it's in our socialization to not really be confident about what we're doing or really celebrate the things that we're really, really good at. Mm. Chris and I talked about this on our walk. Remember in Santa Monica? Mm-hmm. We had we have our date walks and she we literally talked about that. We talked about feeling like we couldn't own our greatness or our power around other people that don't own theirs. Mm. And it it, it, it Dim your light. Mm-hmm. You know That's what I mean? That's the key. Because I was going to say, we like, yeah. they actually do have handfuls of people that I'm like that with, and you're one of them. Yeah. Like, I come up to you and I like run up I and tell you all the special yeah. things that are happening because yeah. I know that you're cheering for me, oh you know? God. And oh, yeah. I had an aha moment in my bathroom like two nights ago, and I was like, you know what? She's actually amazing in this way. She always celebrates my wins and she can handle wherever I'm at mm-hmm. and hold the fullness, even mm-hmm. though she's not going through it. And I was like, that is, I, I made him look at me in the eyes. I'm like, do you hear me? Like, <laughs> she's so great like that, isn't she? Like, she really holds my fullness. Like, that's so amazing for her to be able to do that. Yeah, you. Oh my God. No, not you. <laughs> not, you. <laughs> no, not you. Not you, another friend, but you do that too. Do that. You okay. do that too, but yes. that's not as much of a shock. This yes. other person was a shock. <laughs> okay. Because she doesn't, she doesn't have the things checked off, you know, like yes. she doesn't have the marriage. She doesn't have a loved one. Yes. She's not even dating. Exactly doesn't have mean. a home, you know, like all yeah. these things, but she can always hold the joy for me. And that is so important and beautiful yeah. and something that I want in all friendships and relationships in my life is to be able to do. And you're right. That was the key is that if they can, you know, do that for themselves and if they're fully in their own power, Mm -hmm. then it allows you to celebrate your own. I think the other piece to this is um, I'm always looking at things through the lens of relationships and attachment. And so the thing that um, doesn't allow us in, in this, what we're talking about here, doesn't allow us to talk about what is going great for us or to share what's going wonderful for us when we're in front of somebody who maybe not having that great of an experience is it's called codependency mm-hmm. and codependency means I'm only going to let myself be okay. Oh my if I know that you're okay. Yeah. And if I do, God forbid, do anything that causes you to not oh. be okay, then I lose my okayness. Yeah. And so that, that this is, isn't about us, Ryan. It's about them. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what you mean. Um, so that is something that I'm always trying to look out for. I see it with my family members. I see it with, in all my relationships. Like uh, what I've realized, which I think is so interesting, is if I'm hiding my joy let's just say because I don't want the other person to be uncomfortable yeah. because it's going to trigger them I'm actually stealing an opportunity not only for myself to live in my joy and expand and but I'm also stealing an opportunity for them 
to be with their discomfort. Mm -hmm. If their discomfort is what's going to arise in result in, in reaction to me experiencing joy, then that's exactly what they need to be feeling in that moment. They need to bump against that for their, and they may wig Mm -hmm. out on me and they may, Mm uh, hang up the phone or they, whatever they may do. But I have to allow the space. I'm a triplet, so codependency comes really naturally to me. Like oh, the idea, yeah, the idea of like me being my own person, unattached to others, is so foreign, and I've mm. had to do a lot, a lot of work on like finding out who I am. Um, so I can understand why it's really hard to do that. But what I will say is, it makes relationships like. That's the other thing too, is I've gotten much better at being in the dumps and holding space for others when they're not. Mm. And that's also a really wonderful thing for me to get to do and to not pretend like, yeah, I'm fine and everything's fine. After they tell me that they just won the lottery, I can be like, I'm so happy for you. Yeah, I'm not in that place, but I'm, I can genuinely be really happy for you. Yeah. um, So a couple of things. First of all, I totally get the term. We all have elements of appeasement of others and and the desire to make others feel better and these things that fall in the realm of codependency um I mean, you know my my shtick and half the time like we start applying labels to ourselves like i'm codependent and all that kind of stuff and we we get into trouble in my opinion um that being said the idea of i have to take care of others and if i overextend my joy or my pain it'll cause the other people too much joy or pain in in reverse it also goes back to this zero sum or, um, you know, the, the concept of there just isn't enough to go around, right? Like my joy has to come at the expense of somebody else's joy is a really terrible view of everyday life, right? Because if you think about it, if you look at things that way, that I can only be as joyful as the people around me, because if I, if I give too much, I'm going to take away some of their joy by showing off or whatever the internal language is. I think one of the things that ends up happening without us knowing is we start thinking that every time we're happy it has to come at the cost of somebody else and every time that we're sad it gives somebody else an opportunity to be okay and that speaks to what you were talking about a little bit like if somebody else isn't doing well not just do i have to help them or do i have to support them but is it my role to fix it right starts getting into this tit for tat almost like seesaw game of life and the problem there is you know it's a fun like play like a like a yard game but my hope my sincere hope is that life doesn't work like that like when then I, when i'm up you better be down right that's that's not at all the view i mean i know from um all the kind of course and miracle conversations that i've had with any of the people who've We've been training that this idea that there's a paucity, there's a there's a limit of how much abundance you can have in the world is one of the most terrifying thoughts we have because then then you fall into this trap that well I I got to get mine then there's only a certain amount of happiness and I better go get mine and sorry Ryan I like you a lot but I got to get the one you are going to get too because I need to be really happy. Yeah, there's I don't know if you guys know Gail Hendricks, but in his book that he talked a lot about how we have a meter and usually it's a meter of our happiness and there's a level that we have as, as a set point that was determined when we were a lot younger as a kid that once we reach we are like okay we're, we're almost there and either we will find a way to bring ourselves back down if we go over it or just basically keeping ourselves at a homeostasis level at, at a point of which how much we can be happy and I've definitely come to terms or found places in my life as I've expanded where I've reached levels of happiness and I will look for things to make myself unhappy, whether it's in my personal relationship or within the business where I will find things I've kind of transitioned from, okay, my relationship is good. I feel good with my friends. Okay. This is going to be my problem that I'm focusing on right now because I have to have a current annoyance or issue or anxiety residing within my life because that was my childhood. Um, So that's something else that I've really been working with as it relates to my relationships in all areas of my life is really checking when that meter is reaching a level and seeing what areas in which I'm putting my focus or attention to keep myself from being too happy because that's not my current, that's not my like normal state. I haven't read the book. Is it a lot of set points, a lot of habits we can change throughout our life, right? We can, we can adjust and we can push up how much happiness we're allowed. Is that something that he talks about in terms of your 
ability to once mm-hmm. you develop an awareness of this thing to kind of nudge it up. Yeah, you can like safely expand it. So it's like the awareness that allows you to safely expand to this certain set point. Cool. Um, so we got one crowd question before. Are there any other... I have some ideas on how to like close out the panel, but are there other questions, thoughts? I mean, we're in a freaking bridal shop. Um, <laughs> we haven't... We, I feel like I feel like we talked about the beginning of a relationship. Somebody here is engaged um, Ooh, ring is shining. <laughs> I know she shined up the ring, and um, so it's like there's all these stages, right? Committed relationship, engaged, single, married. Um, I wonder if any of you guys here in the audience have any questions, thoughts. We got one about being in a relationship and your role in terms of taking care of the other person. I was just gonna say, so Adi and I have been together on and off for 15 years. Um, we met when I had a fake ID. I was 20 years old and we met at UCLA and he was getting his PhD at UCLA. It was in his grad program and I was, I transferred in from a school in Maryland, also a really small town. I had been with the same boyfriend for five years. He was the only person I'd ever been with. And then it was very abusive. And then I met a D and I think we've been together for so long now on and off that for me, it's less about the ups and downs. It's more about the like in betweens, like personally, I think I, it, I actually really enjoy the downs now. Like I, I really do because it means that I know that we're going to grow mm-hmm. and I really enjoy the arguments. Like when we don't fight it out and we're just kind of like, fine, we just go to our corners. Like, fuck, now we're going to stay right here. But when we actually duke it out and like take the boxing gloves out, I love it. And I'm like, yay, we're going to grow. And he's like, I'm not ready for that shit. And he's like, <laughs> but I like, it's the best because I know that on the other side is so much expansiveness and places we've never been before. And then we stay there. That's the new norm. So I really like the ups. I really like the downs. The in-betweens for me are more uncomfortable. And I think personally for our relationship, it's about spicing it up, getting creative, you know, in all different ways, like we like we just went to a new restaurant the other night and like we went to like a weed shop and bought some weed like just things that we don't normally do and that's fun and exciting and it went from like I was bummed we didn't go dancing with a friend and then it was like oh but we can create our own magic and he rented a convertible and like we had so much fun and it's like the little moments of just getting excited again like what would excite me in this moment and it can be something really small and it can be something really big and um, for me, it's always looking forward to something like I, we have, you know, like a couple times a year we go partying with our friends and we take some Molly and that's really fun. I look forward to that. I like cleanse the week before and then like B12 shots and like IVs the week after. Like I have like this whole ritual around it. Like leave me alone. It's really fun. Is that the most LA sentence <laughs> anybody has heard in the last like three months? Like the whole quarter? I think I'm going to write a prescription. Like I have a whole... How I can to add to do. that too. How to yes. do, right? You should put it as like an right? ebook right. on your I mean, site. Literally. <laughs> like, I was actually joking the other day. <laughs> uh, like we should do, like go to all the festivals and just teach a lecture course called "How to Do Your Drugs." Literally, yes. I have it down to a science. Workshop, workshop coming soon. Workshop coming soon. <laughs> but it's it's again, it's about it's so personal and it. It's, you know, the minute I start to be like, I'm bored, then I'm like, I'm boring. Like, what's what I tell my kids? Like, if you're bored, you're boring. So figure it out. Get Have fun. Go to different restaurants. Go to different things. Invite new people into your relationship. Like, get new friends. You know, whatever. Like, there's so many. There's a million gazillion ways. Yeah. I think one of the sayings we have in our relationship is um, going in for the punch. I think a lot of us are scared of fights. We're really freaked out. Like our mark for whether a relationship is going well is whether we it's lacking in conflict. How are you guys doing? Good. We don't ever fight. Awesome. What the hell do you guys talk about? Not much. You know, that's it. Because conflict is unnerving for so many of us. So many of us came from families or from backgrounds where either fighting were was explosive and violent and aggressive and scary. Or it was always hidden. Like maybe our parents fought, but we never saw it. They went in the back room and they kind of did their own thing. Oh, we'll talk about this later. Like one of those kind of stern looks. Conflict. We just did a training with um, John Gottman and his wife who are kind of like the relationship gurus. They're amazing. They're amazing. And um, 
you know, they they made this point that was really interesting. I never looked at it this way, even though, again, Sophie and I really embrace conflict. Apparently, she really loves it. Yeah. I haven't quite reached the point of loving it, but um, <laughs> but I embrace it wholeheartedly. And they said, you know, the point of conflict is not to solve problems. The point of conflict is to give you an opportunity to understand each other. And if we can get to a place in a relationship where when we understand, oh, we're half yelling at each other, we're missing the point. Like something is off because we love each other. That's why we're together. Like I said in the beginning, I don't want to lose you. We've been together for a long time. I love the relationship. I love so much about us, but we're fighting about the dishes. Something's up. There's something going on in the relationship that we're not talking about. <laughs> and if we use that conflict as an opportunity to say, oh, let's, let's sit down. Forget the dishes for a second. What's going on? What's happening? Why are you yelling at me? Why are you so mad at me? You've been mad at me for three weeks. What's happening? And we use that as an opportunity. I guarantee we get growth. The thing that sucks is so many of us do what Sophie was talking about before. We kind of we go, oh, forget it. Don't worry about it. Which is really a way of saying, I just don't want to show up. I don't, I don't have what it takes to just come to this. And it right might now. not be I don't want to show up. It might be I'm afraid to show up. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm afraid to do the, the the uncomfortable work of looking at myself. Mm-hmm. I really don't want to look at the ways that my trauma informed my inability to talk to you about what I'm really feeling right now. Or I wish our fight started with that kind of sentence. Right? That's not exactly how they start. But yeah, yes. exactly. I'm just saying that's the internal thing yeah, that's going on. And it's probably there's probably no consciousness around it, too. I think it really boils down to like what we think the purpose of relationship is. Is. You know, what the purpose that we ascribe to relationship is going to inform how we relate with each other. And if the purpose I ascribe to the relationship is this worldly view of relationship, which is that this is this thing in my life or this person in my life that's here to make me happy, that's here for me to have a great time with. Um, okay, that's one that's one po- aspect of the purpose of relationship. But from, um, from a wisdom tradition perspective, from A Course in Miracles perspective, the purpose of relationship is for the growth of both human beings. And so we grow, we're the only species on the planet that waits and waits and waits and resists and resists and resists growth, right? Because it hurts. But all the other species, they put themselves into the cocoon, they break themselves down with an acid, and they reemerge as a butterfly. They go through the pain to get to the other side. We humans will resist pain at all costs. We know if you look in the, in the world of trauma psychology and looking at the neurology of trauma, we know we do that because the brain actually believes that if I go to those places and if I feel those feelings, a couple of us in this room have gone to an incredible place called Onsite, which is a uh, trauma-informed experiential therapy retreat center in outside of Nashville. We learned a lot about the brain and what's happening in the brain of a, uh, of someone who's experienced trauma. Trauma being defined as any moment in your life when you weren't being nurtured, right? So not just these huge T, big T trauma of abuse or divorce of a parent or a mentally unhealthy parent, but also any moments in your life that we weren't being nurtured. Um, but especially for those of us who experience big trauma, which the majority of the women that I know certainly have, a lot of the men that I know certainly have, anyone who was closeted for a lot of their youth, like youth like I was, certainly went through a lot of trauma. We all have our own version of it. And we didn't learn how to feel our feelings because they were overwhelming. And in cases where we experienced the kind of big T trauma that a lot of us experienced, like I'm talking, you know, um, being physically abused, emotionally abused, psychologically abused, um, We survived by not feeling those feelings. We survived by disassociating from those feelings. We survived by freezing or fighting or running, right? And so the brain actually believes today when something triggers that stuff from our childhood, the brain believes if I touch this right now, I will die, right? And so then we show up in relationship. And of course, because the universe is intentional about our healing and we heal through relationship with people, that person is going to push that button, right? We don't have typically the tools to know, oh, they pushed my button and it's an opportunity for my growth. So instead I spend a lot of time blaming them for pushing my button and wishing they wouldn't push my button. And what we forget to do is go like this and look at our chest and see where we have a button and go, oh my God, I have a button. How did I get this button? I really don't want to continue having this button. So I better heal this button because otherwise it's going to keep getting pushed. And so 
relationship, if we can see the purpose of relationship as for my healing and for their healing, and then also recognize that healing happens through having to look at the harder, more challenging stuff in the mirror, then I can see that my partner is here to actually help me become the version of myself that I actually want to become. And it happens through those uncomfortable moments. But both also, the other thing I'll say, in circles like this, right, the people who are coming to events like this, listening to the podcasts, um, a lot of us, we do the work. So what I'm going to say to you is um, find somebody else who's doing the work <laughs> because you can't be the only one doing the work. It has an expiration date. I'm s- can I... Uh- I'm not even ready to announce what the actual like thing will end up being, but literally the conversation we were having just last week about this was we have friends and, and colleagues that um, are in the dating world and they were having these discussions. We're like, God damn, like, I don't know. I'm walking into a date and it's a nightmare. I know it from the first moment that it's a nightmare. And then you have to go through the next, like at least like 20, 30 minutes, you know, none of us want, but do you have uh, you know, to? I don't, I don't think, I mean, no, I'm married. I'm I've been married for 11 years. I don't have to do anything. I'm but but imagine like, mm-hmm. how funny would it be to just walk in, sit down and go, yeah, no. <laughs> and just like get up and just turn around. So anyway, a lot of people don't do that. They stay for just enough minutes to feel like they've paid their dues. But what we were saying is, so Ignited has been about relationships and a lot of it is romantic based relationships, but still in the context of committed relationships. And we were thinking of starting really small, curated, yes, for now they'll be in LA, but we'll move them around, Ignited Singles events. And it would be like application-based events. You got you to gotta admit to get in. There no, there's no app for it. It's, it's IRL. It's, it's like in real life kind of stuff. And that's it. You meet in, in small, curated spaces. Because Ryan, you were saying, you know, find somebody who does the work. Yeah. I'll say I'll say one word. Can I? Uh, how many of our friends will be mad at me? I'll just say Venice. Venice is one of those places where a lot of my friends have walked into places where it seems like people are doing the work, but in very different ways, right? Like there are a lot of enlightened people in Los Angeles. They're not all necessarily on the same path. There's there are endless routes to enlightenment, and the people we know who are looking for relationships are looking for committed long-term relationships that are of the sort where, you know, they're not, their person is not going to make them good. They're not going to create a better reality for them, but somebody to travel that road with them. Um, And again, to kind of maybe take us back a little bit to the beginning of this, living in an age where finding a person to go on a date with you is easier than ever before in the sense that you can be on your lunch break and be cruising for days, right? Like you can be on the way to get coffee at work and try to find somebody to go out on a date with later. It's easier than ever before. The breadth of choices has made it really, really hard to make decisions about dating. Um, and with that, I think maybe, because you know we can talk about dating all night, I was wondering if, Maybe each of you at this these different stages of dating uh, and relationships, if you had one overarching sort of tip recommendation based on where you are right now for people who are in a similar kind of space, what would you say to people who are looking to, I'll go back to the theme of the panel, to consciously couple? People who are looking to have these enlightened, romantically based relationships. I thought you were going to be like, you guys get one hall pass. I was like, okay. I was like, thank you, my hall pass. Um, I guess my advice and thought is like, I put just as much work into the challenging times of our relationship as I do the good. Mm. And that means noting and remembering and putting it in my memory when we are having those moments where I feel like nothing else matters and where I see the beautiful parts of him that like I'm so grateful for. So just making intention and bringing breath back and bringing the moment back to myself so that I'm solidifying in my brain all those amazing things that I love about him gets just as much as my attention as the challenging times and the conflict that we have. And I think that's like my biggest thing that I really work on. I think being single up here, uh, 
first of all, stop saying dating is hard. Mm-hmm. Like, stop saying Sorry. that. Like, put on your red bottoms and let's hit the road. Yeah. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Isabel, nine o'clock, right? So, real talk, they're like, why are we saying dating is hard? Dating is what you make it. You know, stop surrounding yourself with people that say dating is hard too. Yep. Because it's just going to bleed onto you. Honestly, I have so much fun dating. Dating is actually, to me, is where I'm at in my life. Mm. So this summer, I knew I wanted to have fun. Your girl was single, just moved to LA. Like, I wanted to have fun. So I was swiping and going on dates and having a good time. But I was at a point in my life where that is what I wanted. That I was attracting where I was in my life as well. So where I was summer, that's what I was attracting. And guess what? I was okay with it, right? And this is a true story. So two weeks ago, uh, Lynn's, my homegirl Lynn's out there, almost 30, was like, you should go to this dope place in um, Hotel Joaquin. I go to therapy. I'm doing the healing. I'm doing the work. And I go to a space and I kind of just go and breathe by myself once a month. And I went there and I was like, I'm ready for a partner. And this was two weeks ago. I, I said, I'm ready for a partner now. I wrote down what I would love in a partner. Everything from staying up all night, listening to music, he likes looking at the stars. You know what I mean? He loves his mom. You know, he loves to wear Tim's. Like, that shit turns me on. I'm from, a, I'm from Boston, right? So, like, I'm literally writing really everything that I like. And this is kind of weird, but I'm actually going on this day with this guy tonight that literally encapsulated every friggin' thing I wrote. I said, I want him to be in music creatively. He is a music producer. It's just so crazy how yep. it depends on where you are in your life, what you attract. And I know what I want now in dating. Dating is so fun. I'm going to have a blast tonight. Mm. And, my, and maybe in December, he will be my man. And we'll be having Christmas together. <laughs> so I'm just saying, like, you make dating what you want. Like, don't, dating isn't hard. Mm-hmm. Dating is what you make it. And it le- really reflects where you are in your life and what stage in life you're at with yourself, First and foremost, I believe. So if you walk into the date tonight and he's none of the things that you thought he was going to be. Since what if you've, he's not wearing Tim's? What if he's not wearing Tim's? We already talked about this. What if he's not? He doesn't but, own them. But oh, what if there's a bunch of things about it. that yeah. how, so what do you, what do, you do then tonight but, if he's, yeah. he hits none of those things, but he's a great person. It's cool. You just I embrace like it. 20, 25 minutes and be like, I'm yeah. kind of tired. Yeah. I want to go home. I have to work early tomorrow. Great. It's my life. You know what I mean? And I, yeah. and I say this yeah. to say like, this is my, I'm not settling yeah. ever again in my life. I settled before and I'm not settling and everything that I want, I will get. And I believe that. Hell yeah. So here's what, sorry. Here's what I love about both of those. And I just want to point that out. Both Krista and Leticia, you both said a really similar thing about where you are in life. And that is I put my focus on the thing that I want not on what I don't want. And I think so often we are constantly paying attention to what we don't want. We're trying to run away from the thing we don't want, but your brain is paying attention to that thing. And so you keep finding it, like you said, Ryan, before. So, you know, the fights and the arguments and disagreements, they're going to take attention. They just do. Making sure you put enough focus on all the great stuff, make sure your brain remembers all the good stuff instead of constantly only paying attention to the other opposite and hanging out around people or saying yourself constantly, oh man, this dating game, it sucks. Yeah. Tells your brain one thing, yeah. dating sucks. Mm-hmm. And so every time you walk into a date, that's the story that gets told in your head. I love that. And I love that it's shared between both of yours. Um, so in terms of what I <clears throat> what I would offer from what I've learned, two, two things. Firstly, every relationship is an assignment. So this universe is highly intentional about bringing us together. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't need a fucking phone to do it. Yeah. So if you're addicted to your phone and you think the only way you're going to meet someone is on the dating app and on the grind, it's just not true. Like, yeah. walk on the freaking street and just open your eyes. Yeah. Like, the number of people that I've ended up dating who I met at the grocery checkout line just because I was available to it yeah. and I wasn't, like, that looking down at my phone and I was feeling good and I felt attractive because I was you know, feeling myself like that's, that's what matters. And, and so that, that mantra of every relationships and assignment, like getting that thought in your mind, like the person exists, they're already alive, right? If they don't, if they're not alive yet, then they're probably too young for me to start dating them. <laughs> that would be pedophile. <laughs> they're already alive. They already exist. I you know, I, they're just, it's just a matter of time before they enter my path. So telling that story, right? This universe is highly intentional about bringing the person to me who I should be with. That's one thing that I would say. And then the other thing is, 
um, for those of us who do air more on the side of that more anxious attachment, a little bit of that codependency, like you were kind of bringing up Steph, um, a friend of mine, uh, re- said something, said two things to me in a conversation after my breakup before I had like, you know, you, I don't know if any of you, any, anybody else here, I think you actually mentioned it. You were dating somebody a little bit abusive right before yeah. you guys met the like big bad relationship right before the person, right before you meet that person that you're supposed to be with. Um, after I had that last breakup, uh, I was in a relationship with somebody who really aired on the narcissism spectrum in like a really intense way. And um, my friend said two things. One, hey, she, uh, she said two things to me. She said, one, um, stop listening to his words and start listening to his actions. Mm. Um, and that was really huge for me. People, people use their words to speak about who they want to be in the world. Mm. And they're telling you the truth, but their actions are what show what they're actually capable of being in the world today. And that was such a huge shift for me to see their, their actions, follow the actions, follow the actions, follow the actions. If they're saying one thing and doing another, that's some information. And the other piece that she said to me was, wow, Ryan, it sounds like you painted a lot of red flags white. Like we get the information that we need yes. very early on in relationship with somebody. And what we tend to do is we go, yeah, but yeah, but yeah, but and right. And that probably comes from a place within us where we don't feel that we deserve something better. Yeah. And so that would be my pieces. If- literally nothing else to add to that because I was going to say words but (laughs) (laughs) yeah all right Sophie's marriage advice after 15 years of dating is I had things and words added a second layer I love it oh I love that you're painting so many you're painting too many uh red flags white that's awesome um okay I love how variable everybody's experiences are because I think too many times by not having these kinds of conversations about all the different ways of dating and all the different places that we all are in, we can get trapped into what my experience is like and then making that somehow be all of your experiences. And it's just not right. We all have our different experiences. Calling in the person who's a good fit for you is, is a process and a journey and it's singular to you. It's singular to all of us, right? Right. So many times people say, well, where'd you meet him? And then as if like they're going to go to the same place, (laughs) hang out there at the same hour and somehow magically it's like a portal. It's a portal into dating heaven and just random magical unicorn people come out of that place. That's that is the event. (laughs) That is. You're like, so I'm creating the portal. Before Ryan distracted me with his wise words, I was thinking about a long-term relationship and our relationship in 15 years and where we've come from and where who we were and where we're going. And what keeps me inspired in the now is thinking about how many different versions we have been in this 15 years. Like, mm-hmm. I don't even know who those people were. They're adorable. <laughs> like, who are they? <laughs> and where are we going? And they're so, I have no idea. And that's the coolest thing is like, there's so much mystery. People say like, don't you get bored? And it's not like, no, it just keeps getting more fun because we get to continue redefining who we are, up leveling who we are, even when it's uncomfortable as shit. It's amazing. And we do it together and we're supporting each other. Even when we're kind of out of alignment, we can pull each other back in and and we have each other's best interests at heart. And all we both want is to have fun in this. That's what we, that's both of our intention. So to know that we have so many different iterations and even if it is a long-term relationship and it feels sometimes like stuck or there's so many ups and downs, like everything has that and how much better to do it with your partner by your side. Yeah. I mean, if you're going to, you know, it's so interesting to think about if you meet somebody today who's a great fit, how much time do you have with them, right? Like pretty much for every person sitting here right now, you have far more time with this person that you're going to meet, even if you met them right now, than you've spent like on this planet up to now, right? And I know the breadth of experiences I've had up to now, it's just magical to think like, you know, for Sophie and I, what is it? Like we got like 50 years left. I mean, I don't know how much longer I'm going to make it. Best, you know, I'm hoping I'm hoping we crack the hundred 
hundred mark pretty easily by that. But it's like that's pretty amazing to think of. And um yeah, it's all iterations. It's all really magical discoveries and stuff to find somebody who you don't rely on, like we still talk with the codependency, to make you better, but to find somebody who can be there on the road with you as you keep improving and you can watch them improving is really magical. Yeah. Um thank you for everybody who's here tonight for joining us for this little panel. Thank you for the four of you for being here. So if I give you a ride, so um <laughs> It, it, it wasn't as hard, but thank you. I know Ryan, you just came from a trip. Like you literally barely slept last night and, and joined us. Uh, so thank you for doing that. Um, I love these conversations. For those of you who haven't listened to Ignited, uh, please start tuning in. These are kind of the conversations we have every week. Uh, thank you to Flora Vera for having us in this beautiful, beautiful space. And letting my wife wear a gorgeous baby doll dress that... I'm, 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 I'm walking her not not my wife not my wife the dress is on sale um, yeah thank you all thank you all for listening at home love you see you next week thank you everybody for listening to the Ignited Podcast we were so happy to have you along for this ride please go and subscribe to this leave us a review we love hearing from you and if you want more don't forget to go to ignited.com where all the podcast episodes are available with show notes and so many of the little details and links from each one of these interviews. And you can look at all the future events that we have going on, all the things that make Ignited so special, even beyond this recording. Again, thank you so much for joining us. We will see you next week. <laughs>